Welcome back. In parts 9.1 and 9.2, we looked at the importance of choosing a good performance metric. Because of the important role that that plays in the selection of parameters that we'll use for live trading. And we also looked at one performance metric in particular, which was profit factor. And we looked at some of the disadvantages of using this because of the biases that are introduced as part of that calculation. So next, we're going to look at a normalised version of profit factor that gets around these issues. And there are actually two ways that we can do this. The first way is to adjust the values of the profits and the losses from each trade and normalising them against a standard position size. So, for example, one lot. And you will say what the profit would have been if one lot had been placed on that particular trade or what the loss would have been. And this means that each trade contributes to the profit factor score with the same level of influence. So regardless of whether the trade was taken towards the end of the backtest or the beginning of the backtest, it has an equal relevance rather than having a bias as we saw in the standard calculation of profit factor. The second way of doing it, of course, is to simply fix the position size of trades as part of the backtest itself. But the disadvantage there is that you don't get to see any of the exponential growth and don't get a clear indication of how your system would perform in a live setting. OK, so now let's move on to a performance metric that I prefer in favour of profit factor, which is the compound annual growth rate divided by the maximum drawdown. Now, this is actually very similar to the Kalmar ratio, if you're familiar with that. The only difference is that the Kalmar ratio is always performed over a set period of time, whereas this metric can be based on any backtest time frame. So firstly, let's concentrate on the reward aspect of this metric, which is the compound annual growth rate. And as the name suggests, this takes account of compounding. And so as position sizing increases, as the equity increases, that's catered for within this particular calculation. And there are only three inputs into this. The first is the final equity at the end of the backtest. You've also got the starting equity and Y here represents the number of years. And this can, of course, be a decimal. So if you've tested over three and a half years, then this would be one over 3.5 as the power that that's being raised to. Or if you prefer to do this on the basis of days, then you just use 365 over the number of days. Now, in terms of the downside risk element, we're using the maximum drawdown here, which is a percentage, not an absolute value. And although this metric is very popular and used by many people, it does introduce yet another bias. And that's in relation to the frequency of the drawdowns that have been experienced throughout the backtest. So again, let me illustrate what I mean. So we'll do that looking at two different equity curves. So this is the first one with one major drawdown, as you can see here. <clears throat> now, the second one is going to experience lots of drawdowns, but eventually end up with the same equity. So if you look at the inputs into the calculation, the starting equity is the same and the final equity is the same. Now, as you can see with the drawdowns, the line in red here experiences three major drawdowns, all of approximately the same size. Whereas the system with the black equity curve only suffers one drawdown and actually gives us a much more preferable equity curve than the one that you see in red. Most traders would prefer to trade this system in black than the red one. However, because we're just looking at maximum drawdown here, both of these systems score exactly the same using this particular metric. So their CAGR over max drawdown values would not distinguish them at the point of selecting the best parameters. And for me, this is one of the major drawbacks of this metric. Because unless you're actually going to look at every single equity curve that exists for all of your parameter values, you're not going to be able to distinguish between these two systems. 
And so this is why the next metric we're going to look at, which is the compound annual growth rate over the mean or the average drawdown, for me is a far superior performance metric. Although I suspect there are far fewer traders actually using this. As I said earlier, I need to split the range of performance metrics that I'm looking at over two episodes. And so that's all we've got time for this week. In next week's session, however, it gets really interesting because the use of CAGR over the mean drawdown and the linear regression based metrics happen to be my preferred methodologies for selecting parameters. So make sure you're subscribed so you get a notification of when that episode is released. And if you found this useful today, it's always greatly appreciated if you can give me a thumbs up. And so until next time, trade safe.